all of this climaxes in this monumental thought, the good work of your life as you walk in that. You are walking in what God prepared for you to walk in long before you existed. But here, this final phrase here that Paul says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the first thing that I ask is, why did Paul say that? Why was that there? Didn't it feel like Paul could have put a period? For you are, for his workmanship you are, created in Christ Jesus for good works. I mean, couldn't, couldn't there have been the, the end of that thought? Because doesn't it seem like that Paul has made the point? Why did he feel the need to go further talking about these works that are prepared beforehand and us walking in them? Furthermore, Paul is going to use a very unique and somewhat awkward phrase in saying that these works are prepared beforehand. Why didn't Paul say planned? Doesn't that seem like it would have made more sense? You are His workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God planned beforehand. Doesn't that seem to match? Why would He put it this way? And why does He feel like that He's not yet done with His point? So He's going to say to us some things about the works, and He's going to call these works prepared beforehand. These works that are prepared beforehand. I think the reason, the underlying reason that Paul is doing this, I think he wants to leave us with a profound sense that these good works, these these things in our life that in some way look like Jesus, when we see those things in our life, he wants us to think God is here. When we see something about our life or the lives of believers around us, when we see something that looks like Jesus, that sounds like Jesus, Paul wants us to have a profound sense that's God. God is here. God is working. As I do this thing, as I serve in this way, as I commit this righteous deed, I am doing what God has prepared for me all along. I am walking in the life that He has prepared for me, and I am doing it with Him right here with me. He wants to leave a profound sense in His readers that as you do these righteous things, these things that look and sound and act something like Jesus, that you are living out the life that has been prepared for you and doing the works that have been prepared for you. Now, as we think about this phrase, good works, it's not something that Paul uses frequently. He only uses this phrase a couple of times. Almost every time that Paul says the word works, he means evil works, or he means works in which someone is uh, attempting to gain God's favor by works of religion. That's usually what he means by that word. It's rare that he pairs this up with the adjective good and uses it in this way. So what does he mean by these good works? I think what we need to guard ourselves against thinking is that, that Paul is talking about some sort of random good deed, like helping the old lady across the street or helping the elderly person with their groceries out to their car. That is a good work, yes. That is a righteous thing. But I don't think what Paul has in mind here is just the sort of, oh, I volunteered down at the coop, uh, the coop, coop sitchin, the soup kitchen the other day. I don't think he has in mind this sort of good thing that you do here or there or, or, you know, whatever. Because he says that these good deeds are prepared that we may walk in them. Now, whenever we see that phrase, walk, walk in them, whenever we see that in our scriptures, that is speaking of a way of life. That is speaking of a 
manner of living. That's not speaking about something I might do at the, as I leave the checkout at the grocery store. That's speaking of what my life is about. So I think what Paul has in mind here with the good deeds, the good works that God has prepared beforehand is something closer to what I do with my life, how I'm living my life. What, it, I'll take myself as the example here. This, pastoring a flock of God's people, being the under shepherd for a flock of God's people, this is the good work that Paul speaks of. For you, it's the good work that he has prepared for you in whatever vocation or capacity that may be. So with that in mind, he's speaking more of a life pattern. He's speaking of something that is not just, I did this three days ago. It's, this is what my life is involved in. This is what my life is about. So what Paul is saying here. He is going to clearly use these phrases that require us to believe that these things were prepared for us. Again, he could have easily used the word that meant planned, that God planned for you to do these things. He didn't use that word. He used the word prepared for you. God has prepared these things. And he says that God has prepared them before. Now, when does he mean before? I think that Paul, when he says that these have been prepared before, I think he means the same thing here that he meant in chapter 1, verse 4. In chapter 1, verse 4, he speaks of before the foundation of the world. And the reason that I think that this is the same thing is because there he tells us we were chosen before the foundation of the world to be what? Holy and blameless before him. So is there a clear parallel between God's choosing us to be holy and blameless and the good works that we walk in? I think one is the natural outcropping of the other. So if God chose one before the foundation of the world, then it seems that he chose both at the, before the foundation of the world. So what Paul is requiring us to see here is that the path of your life was something God prepared long before you existed. And that is the earth-shattering thought that he wants to leave this section with. Paul knows how to be climactical and he knows how to bring a point to its climax and he's been working towards this from chapter 1 and verse 4 and the climax here is this new creation in Christ all the glorious realities of chapter 1 all the ugly realities of the beginning of chapter 2 that he saved you from all of this climaxes in this monumental thought, the good work of your life, as you walk in that, you are walking in what God prepared for you to walk in long before you existed. Now, let's sort of tease that out a little bit. And I want to change a little bit of the wording here. I'm not going to change the meaning, but I'm going to change a little bit of the wording just to kind of help us toss it around and get our spiritual arms around it a little bit better. So Paul's talk talks about preparing the good works of our life. Let's change that to the story of your life. Does that fit? The story of your life. Isn't your life a story? Aren't you living out a story? And so what Paul's saying here is that God wrote the story of your life. And as you, this new creation in Christ, are living in these good works that He has prepared, you are living the story that He has written for you. I see no other way to understand that, that what Paul wants us to see is the path of your life is something that God not just planned, but prepared before Him. Now, before we go much further, let me just interject this, because this, it's always helpful just to remind ourselves. Paul is not suggesting that we're some sort of robot. 
that we're some sort of automaton, that we just blindly bump around through life, having no other choice but to just go the path that God has set before us. That's not Scripture never, nowhere in Scripture, are you allowed to believe that you are freed from having to make choices. David affirms in Psalm 42, verse 11, that he must choose to trust God. He must choose to hope in God. So never do the Scriptures say to you, oh, God's planned this out, so just put yourself on autopilot. It doesn't matter what you, what you do. No. Jesus says, strive to enter by the narrow gate. Now that word strive, Jesus chose His word carefully. That's literally the word that we get our word agonize from. So Jesus was literally saying agonize to enter through the narrow gate. Meaning, this is not going to happen without your intense effort. But nevertheless, the two realities that Scripture presents to us are you must strive to enter through the narrow gate all the while following the path that God has prepared for you since before the foundation of the world. How do we explain those two? As we've said many times before, I don't know. I can't understand it, much less explain it. But the Scriptures teach me that I walk the path God prepared for me before the foundation of the world. Also, I can make bad choices. And I can make wrong choices. And I can make selfish choices. And I'm responsible for those selfish choices. So this path of life, the story of our life, here I think is what Paul is getting at. He, he wants us, the one who has now absorbed the incredible truths from chapter 1 verse 4 up to the present point, he wants us to be in a place where we can trust the author of our story. Does this resonate with you that you have this idea of what your life should be? That you have sort of this vision, this, this dream, this plan of what your life should be? And oftentimes you find yourself asking God to join you in your plan for your life? Does that resonate with anybody other than me? That you have this vision, that you have this... This thing worked out. Here's what I need to be doing. Here's what I should be pursuing. Here's what I need to be doing. And you desire for God to enter into your life to make your dreams come true. Now, often those are godly dreams. If you are alive to God, then your dreams should be godly dreams. But even godly dreams can be ours. And we can find ourselves in the place of asking God to come into our life and make our plans come true. Sometimes that's the way it works because sometimes those plans and those dreams are what God has planted in us. Sometimes they're not. But the struggle comes when we become fixated upon that. And then we experience worry and anxiety. There's many ways you can define anxiety and worry. Here's one that sort of fits this morning's context. Worry is when you think you know what your life should work out to be and God doesn't seem to be able to make, bring it about. Or God doesn't seem to be interested in bringing about what you think your life should be. That I think we can think of that properly as anxiety or worry that... that I've got this, this plan, this, this, here's what I need to be doing, here's what I need to be working, I should be at this point, and, and here's my goal for this, and it's just not coming about. Again, I'm going to use my own self as an example here. 17, 18 years ago, I wanted nothing but to be on the mission field. I knew where I wanted to go, I learned the language of the place that I wanted to go. I mean, I just knew. I mean, why would God not put someone on the mission field that wanted to go. Why would he not? Until over a period of about two and a half years, every single door was closed. And that was one of the biggest, that was one of the three most difficult times of my life. 
one of the biggest struggles was coming to terms with a God that was not ready to enter my life and make my plans come true. Instead, what he was saying to me was, I have a plan. And I invite you to come along with my plan for your life. At the time, I was a pastor in a small church, took the church just as, as sort of a, a means of doing something for a couple years while I was finishing up my uh, first part of seminary or my first uh, seminary degree there, preparing to enter the mission field. I thought, well, I'll just pastor a church for two or three years. There'll be some good experience, pay the bills. But this is not what I want to do. I'm going to the mission field. I even told the church, I'm going to the mission field. Here I am, 16 years later. But this was his plan that he prepared beforehand. My problem was that I had to realize that God wants me to join his plan for my life that he prepared long before. Instead of saying, no, God, this is the plan. Didn't you hear me? I'm going to the mission field. I need you to come along and bless my plan. Modern evangelicalism is absolutely poisoned with the idea of asking God into your life. It's absolutely poisoned. Find that in the Bible. Find the concept in the Bible somewhere of asking God to come into my life. Now, it is absolutely true that our lives are changed when Jesus Christ redeems us, when the Holy Spirit indwells us. Yes. But it's also true that the Scriptures teach emphatically God has prepared your story. And He is the perfect story writer. God has prepared a complex story for all of us. Now, there may be somebody somewhere that God has prepared a simple story. I don't know them. Maybe it's you, but I don't... Everybody I know has the story of their life that's complex. It's here, it's there, it's twists, it's turns, it's U-turns, it's, it's reconfiguring. It's, that's the story of my life, probably the story of your life. And I think that's the story of most everyone's life is that God has prepared for you a complex story of twists and turns and rethinks. But doesn't that make a good story? You ever read just a, a remarkable story at which it's just full of twists and turns and unexpected letdowns? And, th and then at the end, this skilled writer brings it all together in such a way that you say, oh, now I see why that happened. Now I see why they took me on that big loop. And God is the perfect story writer. The path that He has prepared for us is infinitely better than any path we could make for ourselves. Do you realize that? You could, on your own, be as successful as this world will allow. You could achieve every level of success. You could be like Billy Graham. But if that was not the path prepared for you, in God's eyes, you are a failure. On the other hand, God's path for your life could be one of obscurity and struggle. And you could live your life impacting one person. And that is a far, infinitely greater life. That is an infinitely more important and more significant life than all of the Billy Grahams put together when that wasn't the prepared path of God. Do you see how for God to prepare the path of your life, it doesn't matter if you're cleaning toilets. If that's the prepared path for your life, that is the most glorious life that we could live. Remember the story of Joseph? Remember Joseph? Remember how Joseph, his life took a lot of turns, didn't it? I mean, he, was, he goes from being his father's favorite to thrown down a pit to sold as a slave to ruling the household of, of the soldier guy, Potiphar, 
to uh, accuse falsely, thrown in jail again, to run in the jail, to run in Egypt. I mean, that, that story had a lot of twists and turns. But do you remember at the end of the story, Jacob and his brothers, they'd all come down to Egypt and Joseph had saved their lives and everything. They were living down. And then Jacob dies. And after Jacob, the father dies. Remember all the brothers, they come to Joseph and they say, hey, Joseph, right before dad died, he told us that you're supposed to forgive us. I think they made all that up because they were thinking that once dad was dead, Joseph is going to let us have it. So they said, well, jo Jacob, our dad, his dying wish was that you would be nice to us. Remember Joseph's response? Am I in the place of God? 